Are we ready? Yes. Okay. Hello and welcome to the final um, session in our series, Mammy Open Studies, Mammy Do You Love Me? Um, uh, as part of the, the two year, the new two year uh, Doctor of Design program. Uh, this is the very final session, Mammy, Mammy in the Sea Level Rise. Um, and it follows an extraordinary journey that we've taken looking at um, Miami, yeah, the year around Miami. We started off with some uh, a series of uh, sessions on the architecture of, of, of Miami itself, the work of Zaha Hadid, uh, and the journey up to Mar-a-Lago. We then started looking at the cultural life of Miami, um, at uh, the extraordinary cultural life of Miami. And finally, towards the end, we've been looking at the, 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 the very curious, unique ecology um, of, of Miami. Uh, not only the, uh, the coral around the area, but the Everglades. And then last week, um, uh, the, a reference to the, the city in, in the swamp. This week actually picks up on some of the discussions that which were initiated last week about sea level rise. Uh, this is, of course, a crucial issue to Miami. Um, already with king tides in Miami, uh, the, 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 the Miami beach itself floods very often. Um, and uh, inevitably in the future, sea level rise is going to be a huge have a huge impact on things. Um, so today I'm delighted to be able to be, to be joined by two of my colleagues um, from FIU, um, by uh, Thomas Spiegelhalter, um, who has be, was a colleague of mine actually initially at the University of Southern California, USC, before he came to FIU. Thomas has a very distinguished career. Uh, he was a full professor in, in Germany before he moved across the States, I think in 1999, and has now been made a full professor again at uh, FIU. Um, he has been extremely successful both as an architect and also as a researcher in, in charge of the Crunch Project and others. Um, and I'd also I'd like to welcome uh, Darren Ockert, uh, who, like Thomas, also from, um, from Europe. Uh, uh, Thomas is from Germany. Darren Ockert is from the UK. Um, and this, of course, is a very special day for the UK because the Duke of Edinburgh uh, died this morning. That's something very significant. And we're all very fond of, of the Queen. Um, so we wish, wish her well. Darren has had a, a very... Um, a uh, remarkable career in its own way. He was he started off as a as a, a rock singer, and he's been working in the theatre some time before embarking on a career in architecture. He's been my student at FIU, and he's about to complete his studies at FIU. Um, we'll kick off with with Darren. Um, Darren, it's it's great to see you, um, and welcome. Um, let me just stop sharing my screen so you can go ahead. Thank you, Neil. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me to to talk about this. this is a subject that's uh, very dear to my heart so um, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, let me see if I can share my screen and put this into present okay is that uh, is that showing now yes okay great. Um, so um, this talk is going to be about uh, sea level uh, rise, but um, really what we're looking at is um, designing for a symptom of climate change. We can't really look at sea level rise without thinking of it uh, as a symptom of climate change. So I'm specifically going to look at um, the South Florida and Miami uh, metro area. Um, so we're going to go through a, a few things. Uh, we're going to look at uh, uh, sea level rise being a symptom and treating the cause. Uh, I'm going to look at some datums and how we, we calculate sea level rise. Then I'm going to go into looking at sea level rise in South Florida as a regional dilemma. Then look at more specifically Miami-Dade as a local dilemma. And then look at some other events. And then um, I'm going to hand over to Thomas, who is going to uh, show some of his research over the last uh, uh, several decades, I think, uh, Thomas, uh, but more specifically, some of the, the research he's been doing at FIU recently as part of the crunch uh, research, which is six uh, cities uh, studying the effects of sea level rise on the environment. So I want this quote from Craig uh, Fugate, who was Florida's former director of emergency management. 
and also FEMA head under Obama. And he says, we cannot keep building the way we always have and expect a different outcome in future disasters. Um, so as designers, we must keep this in mind that sea level rise is just one symptom of a much bigger problem, uh, the problem being global climate change. And as designers, we need to always keep that in the back of our minds uh, because we don't want to be uh, doing, what, what we don't want to be doing is designing to mitigate sea level rise and at the same time feeding the cause of climate change. So this is equivalent to say taking Lipitor to lower blood cholesterol while continuing to eat hamburgers every day for lunch. Um, so uh, if we thought COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, was a, a big global disaster and reminded us that the world is fragile and demonstrated the inherent risks of high levels of interdependence, uh, COVID-19 will seem like a drop in the ocean, pun intended, compared to the intense and cascading global challenges that will be caused by climate change. Uh, the U.S. National Intelligence Council just released, uh, I, I think it was released a couple of days ago, their March uh, 2021 report. And they're saying during the next 20 years, the physical effects from climate change of higher temperatures, sea level rise and extreme weather events will impact every country. The costs and challenges will disproportionately fall on the developing world, intersecting with environmental degradation to intensifying risk to food, water, health, and energy security. And I want to quickly look at why, as designers, we need to always keep uh, the cause of sea level rise in the back of our minds and look at every decision through the lens of climate change. So this is uh, the United Nations 2019 Global Status Report for Buildings and Construction. And this concluded that building and construction and operations accounted for the largest share of both global final energy use, which is 36%, and energy-related CO2 emissions, which is 39%. Uh, it is design decisions uh, that are contributing to these numbers. And I want to just show a very quick example of, of something that um, ha happened in New York City last year. Uh, and as we cannot remove global climate change from the equation when talking about sea level rise, uh, this is example is uh, of a recent building code change in New York City. So implementing sustainable and resilient design choices is often challenged by both economical and political factors. So New York City decided to do away with both of those factors in decision-making uh, by introducing a local law 92 and local law 94 on November 15th, 2019. And these changes uh, uh, to the building code uh, means that New York City Department of Big Buildings require all new buildings and existing buildings undergoing certain major roof renovations to have solar pho uh, photovoltaic systems a green roof system or a combination of the two. And these systems must cover 100% of any applicable roof. So this is addresses the, the urban heat island effect, but also drastically reduces operational energy consumption in these buildings. So it's dealing directly with the, the cause of, of climate change. Uh, so let's, let's now look at, at, at sea level rise uh, in the region of South Florida. Um, I'm first going to start with um, datums, like where is zero when we're talking about sea level rise? Um, in, in Florida, uh, in South Florida, and particularly the Miami area, we use a, uh, a, a, a tidal station on Virginia Key, which is not far from uh, Miami. It's a little uh, uh, island just off the, the uh, downtown area. Uh, this is a photo of that uh, Virginia Key. And these, this is some of the data that, that comes from uh, that station. So we have um, different uh, alphabet soups of letters, which all represent a zero point. Uh, most people are common with mean sea level, uh, meaning the, 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 the mean level of sea as it goes through the tidal uh, process each day and, and where that sits, and that, that's considered uh, zero. The problem with this is as sea level is rising uh, and rising uh, much faster than we anticipated, that level of zero is moving up. So how do we determine how quickly the sea level is rising? So we have um, 
a couple of other uh, uh, datums uh, that we use. Um, originally, we used NGVD, which is the National Geodetic Vertical Datum, established in 1929. And this was originally known as the sea level datum and officially changed its name in 1973. Uh, this is based on the Earth's geoid, uh, the shape of the ocean surface, and the influence of gravity and rotation of Earth alone. This was superseded by the North American vertical datum, which most architects use uh, in uh, and surveying uh, companies use in North America. And this consists of a leveling network on the North American continent, ranging from Alaska through Canada across the United States. And it's affixed uh, to a single point on the continent. Of course, there's problems with this as well, because land uh, can, can sink, um, particularly when we build on large areas of land. Um, so that's not uh, necessarily a, a fixed point either. Uh, and the, the last um, uh, one that we have on here is the geodetic reference datum, which is going to replace all of these in 2021. And this is going to be based on satellite uh, data uh, and should be a much more um, fixed point of zero that we can work from. So looking at uh, the region as a whole, so that's just a little background of where we're, we're, we're working from as far as what zero is uh, for, for sea level. Um, the South Florida region has joined together uh, four of the counties that consist of the most populous area of uh, South Florida. Uh, Palm Beach County, um, which is uh, obviously known for West Palm Beach, uh, where uh, ex-President Trump uh, has his Mar-a-Lago uh, compound. We have Broward County, which is known for uh, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Miami-Dade, obviously Miami beaches uh, and Miami city proper. And Monroe County, which consists mainly of uh, the Keys from Key Largo down to Key West and all of that low-lying um, uh, island area. So these four counties uh, joined together to create the Southeast Florida Regional Climate uh, uh, Compact, Climate Change Compact. Uh, and the whole area covers a population of around 6.2 million people. So it was important that this area had a unified uh, sea level rise projection, uh, that, that the, the area was not building to different projections of sea level rise. So um, the unified sea level rise projection uh, was, was originally uh, given out in 2015. Uh, and then data showed that this was the sea level of rise in South uh, Florida region was happening much quicker than anticipated. So this uh, projection was updated in 2019, two years ago. And I'm sure it will be updated uh, uh, again, probably in the next five years. Um, so what this is doing is um, we had to, they had to fix a, a point in time uh, when uh, sea level rise, when sea level was at a certain point. So this was fixed in the year 2000 based on the mean sea level uh, in the, the, the city of Key West, uh, which is the, the furthest south uh, key on the chain of, of islands in Monroe County. So obviously this has, um, this sea level, uh, mean sea level has increased uh, since then about eight inches. Uh, but, but it's still based on the level that the, the mean sea level was at in 2000. And these projections, um, we have here the, uh, the lowest projection, which the, is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from the UN. And then we have three uh, estimates and projections from NOAA, um, which is the US agency. And somewhere in between those is, is what we're working on for the 50 year planning horizon uh, in the, the four counties in South Florida. So what they're expecting uh, is around 17 uh, inches, which is about 43 centimeters uh, of sea level rise from that point in the year 2000 in Key West uh, by the year 2040 and by the year 2070, uh, we're going to see about 40 inches, which is about 102 centimeters, so just over a meter. Uh, if we take this out 100 years, we're looking at about 92 um, 
uh, inches, which is about 2.3 meters. Um, but, but mainly for infrastructure, they're looking at this 50 year planning horizon. If we, uh, if we look at this in uh, NAVD, which is the, the other datum, which is often used for surveying and um, uh, for architecture drawings, uh, we see that this is actually um, above ground. We're, we're looking at by 2040, uh, 0.6, this is in feet now, uh, feet uh, rise, which is about 18 centimeters. And by 2070, uh, which is the 50 year planning horizon, we're looking at 2.5 feet, which is 76 uh, centimeters. Why is this uh, important? Uh, if we look on a local level in Miami-Dade, we see that most of the, um, the land uh, in Miami-Dade is below eight feet. So we have this area, if we look at this, um, this um, map here, we have this area which is in the brown, which is the, the ridge uh, of high ground that runs uh, north, south, pretty much along the coast. But as you can see on the east side with Barry Islands and on the west side where the Everglades uh, sit, we have uh, ground that is much lower than this. So we have this high ridge, but then surrounded on either side by very low lying ground. On the right, the map on the right, we're looking at the number of days uh, of flooding per year with two feet of sea level rise. Now, the two feet is taken from this 50 year planning horizon. And if we go back to the previous chart, we see that that's actually the intermediate and uh, there are possibilities if we have an ice shelf uh, uh, break off that this could be much higher than that. So we, we are just looking at this uh, middle area right now. So we can see from this, uh, there are lots of areas that are gonna be flooded uh, 365 days of the year, including areas uh, on Miami beach. Uh, and then if we, if we look down here, there's a lot of areas that are gonna be flooded most of the year, particularly on Miami beach and the barrier islands but also this low lying area in the south of the county. And we're also gonna see uh, some increases on the back here where we have the low lying land from the Everglades. And that's mainly because this water is flowing from, um, from the north to the south to drain into the, into the ocean. Uh, and if we have a buildup of, of, uh, of ocean water, this drainage is gonna slow down considerably and we run the risk of having flooding on this back, back end of the land. Uh, a little bit of uh, history about the, the, these barrier islands like Miami Beach and um, the Venetian islands. A lot of them, uh, other than the sandbar, which is Miami Beach, a lot of these smaller islands were man-made and they were, they were created by uh, dredging the bay, uh, particularly to make the, the channel for the, uh, the port here and using that dredged material to create these very low level islands, which are only one or two feet above, uh, above the ocean. And this is how it looks today. So you can see this, this, uh, this is the, the port here, Port of Miami, uh, which was dredged quite deeply. And then that material was used to create all of these islands that sit between the barrier island, Miami Beach, where you see the high rises in the background. And then these very expensive luxury homes on these um, uh, man-made islands. Um, so the uh, Miami-Dade Sea Level Rise Task Force uh, just uh, several weeks ago released their uh, sea level rise strategy for Miami-Dade County. And this has been a process that's been going on uh, for many years. Um, and this document is accumulation of some of the uh, approaches to adapting to sea level rise in Miami-Dade. And they've, they've chosen five uh, main uh, adaptive approaches, which I'm gonna go through. Um, one that has uh, kind of been left off here, I think probably uh, for political reasons is uh, retreat, uh, to <laughs> completely retreat from the area. Um, but this is a way of working with sea level rise and, and uh, the rising waters and some interesting strategies, which I know that Thomas has covered with his students and with many of the design proposals um, that were part of the, re the crunch research that he's been focusing on the last three years. So um, 
the five strategies of build on fill, build like the keys, county, the line, they all um, storm surge completely flow over those islands. Uh, so the building code in the keys is to raise, uh, the, raise the living level up to the second floor. Uh, so generally these are about 14 feet above uh, what, the, what the level of the ocean would be. Um, so that's one of the strategies. And then build on high ground around transit hubs. So this is uh, the, the, the ridge and uh, expand greenways and blueways and create green and blue neighborhoods. So let's, let's look at each of, one of, each of those individually. So the first one, build on fill. So this is um, raising the land on artificial fill. So if we look at the top condition, and these, these are all from the, the strategy that was released. So you can, you can actually download this full strategy with much more detailed uh, information on how these strategies work. Uh, but the first one is taking a, an area that exists and excavating and then raising uh, that area up. It's also known as cut and fill. Um, so in a similar way to how those original uh, islands were built, those man-made islands in the bay, this would be a similar strategy. So raising up uh, buildings, um, this, is, this is more of a, a, a gray infrastructure type of solution. Uh, sea walls would also be raised uh, depending on their condition. Um, <clears throat> And it's, it's repeatedly keeping the, the land above uh, the changing water level. Um, and this would also require managing stormwater on site. So it doesn't run off to other, you know, from the higher properties and increase flooding to, to other, other neighborhoods. So it does have some challenges. Uh, the next uh, strategy is build like the keys. As I mentioned, this would require building, uh, uh, elevating structures on pilings and live basically living with more water uh, flowing under and around buildings. Uh, this is uh, best practices in, in the Florida Keys for design. Um, and it allows storm surge and, and uh, flooding to, to move under the houses and not, not cause problems. The next strategy is build on high ground. So as we saw in the, the previous slide on the, the elevation of South Florida area, Miami-Dade in particular, we do have this higher ridge. So this would be concentrating on new developments in the least flood prone areas along transit corridors, uh, focusing on new growth uh, to areas that are on the ridge, the naturally higher ground, and, and around existing and planned transportation corridors in line with the county's strategic Miami area rapid transit, which they call the, the SMART plan. Uh, so that ridge runs north to south, uh, it's less prone to, to flooding from storm surge, the heavy precipitation events we get in South Florida, and long-term sea level rise. Uh, some of these transit co corridors already exist because of uh, historic railroads that, that already ran along the ridge. So this is uh, opportunities for infill development, uh, places for new affordable and mixed income housing, or businesses could be replaced underutilized land like parking lots or vacant lots around this transit. Uh, wastewater systems, they would need to be improved in these areas to accommodate this new growth, while low, lower lying areas would not be the focus of future growth. Um, so this is a, a strategy just really building on the natural uh, elevation of, the, of the, the, this ridge. Uh, our next strategy is expand, the fourth strategy, expand greenways and blueways. So if we look at this, um, really uh, these small uh, canals uh, are not really big enough to handle the, uh, the amount of water we will be getting from precipitation and from uh, sea level rise. So it's, it's expanding waterfront parks, making room for canals in the most flood prone neighborhoods. Uh, this approach focuses on expanding and creating new corridors that provide a buffer against floods. Greenways and blueways are trails, walkways, boardwalks that serve as linear parks and can connect multiple parks or places along the waterfront and in low-lying areas. So this approach increases access to water because uh, that's actually one of the problems in Miami. We have all this water, but you, you actually uh, sometimes end up never seeing it. Uh, the access to water is, is a problem. Uh, and it creates space for more trees and living shorelines, stores and filters water, and adds transportation options and recreational areas. So expanding the parks also helps 
uh, the neighboring properties by providing a buffer from storms and creating a safe space to accommodate floodwaters. Uh, this approach also provides relief to people living in vulnerable areas that have been repeatedly flooded if they want to move to safer areas. Uh, this transition of land use requires significant public education and engagement and more efficient and is more effective when addressing uh, continuous parcels in the most vulnerable areas as opposed to individual properties. So what this means is um, buying out areas of land and converting them back to uh, natural habitats like the mangroves, which protect against uh, wave action and also uh, you know, provide filter for, for the water. Um, this has been successful in, in areas like New Jersey. After some of the flooding that happened in New Jersey, there were whole communities that uh, were bought out at market rate and uh, the houses were demolished and moved and the land was restored to a protective uh, natural uh, flood zone. Um, what, what the state realized was it was actually much cheaper to do that and deal with the de demolition now and clean up the environmental disaster after these properties and neighborhoods were flooded with, uh, with storm surge. Uh, and the last strategy is to create uh, green and blue neighborhoods. So um, this is creating a network of small spaces for water in uh, gardens, streets, yards, parks. And this approach focuses on finding space for water on a smaller scale throughout communities. Um, it involves removing pavements and per per perviable uh, uh, pavements and finding more room for green and blue infrastructure, including rain gardens, swales, uh, trees and permeable materials like gravel, shells, pavers and porous pavement. Uh, this helps manage uh, water from runoff because that's um, a huge problem with, uh, um, with this particular area as the sea level is rising. Uh, there's less capacity to drain um, uh, precipitation in, in these, um, uh, in, in South Florida, we have participation, pre um, precipitation events that are um, uh, very short, but very intense. Uh, we can have, uh, you know, seven inches of rainfall in an afternoon. So this, this kind of mitigates some of those uh, problems. So those are the five strategies that the county is, is focusing on. And looking at these uh, precipitation events, um, I actually remember this event in 2017 because I was about to go and see uh, Al Gore's second movie, uh, An Inconvenient Truth 2. I think it was called Truth, Truth to Power or something like that. Um, and th the day before this event, there was uh, something called a, a rain bomb event and seven inches, which is 17.8 centimeters of rainfall fell uh, on the city of Miami Beach and caused uh, immense flooding. Um, and this was after the city of Miami Beach had actually installed uh, street pumps to, to cope with this kind of event. They had, um, uh, they had these street pumps and they also had raised many of the roads to, to try and prevent such uh, an event like this happening. So this was a use of gray infrastructure that um, at the time failed. Um, we can see here how, how, how high the water raised uh, on Miami Beach. Um, there, were, there were actually areas where cars were floating. Um, so this is a look at some of the, the tidal mitigation that, that Miami uh, Beach has, has um, spent millions of dollars incorporating into, into the city to try to uh, mitigate the problems of, of tides uh, uh, together with um, sea level rise. We have a problem in the, the months of October and uh, November where we have a phenomena called a king tide, which is the highest tides of the year. And the problem with that was it was getting, uh, the tides were rising so high that it was coming up through storm drains. So uh, the, the, the drains that were, were put there to, to, to drain away uh, and mitigate water flooding were actually helping uh, cause the problem. So the water was backing up through these drains and coming up through the, 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 the gratings in the streets and causing a lot of flooding. So this was um, a, a project called uh, Miami Beach Rising Above. And it was installing these pumps that you can see uh, on the left here, uh, which would pump water out of the city raising the roads and installing seawalls, which you can see on the middle one, 
middle uh, photo. Um, and also putting backflow preventers in the drain, uh, the storm drains, so that um, if the tide did ri ri uh, rise up, that it was not uh, backing up through the drains and causing flooding in lower parts of the city. Um, this uh, on the very right shows how the roads were raised. And there, there's a few uh, problems from, from this gray infrastructure that came to light. Uh, if we look at this middle uh, photo, this is a seawall that's being uh, built along Indian Creek here, and the road is being raised. But you'll notice on this left side that the residential properties here, that seawall is not actually being raised for them. So what we see is um, uh, an increase in flooding on this left side, uh, whereas this, this road, which is a hurricane evacuation road, uh, remains uh, free of flooding. And on this uh, picture on the right side, we see uh, existing uh, finished floor level of these buildings that are already uh, existing in the Sunset Harbor area and a raising of the road. Um, so we can see that there, uh, there has been some problems at the beginning of this uh, where water was collecting and still flooding these properties, even though the roads were completely free of water. Um, and I'm going to skip the next section. It, this was uh, uh, a little bit about how uh, septic tanks and wastewater in, in the area and a terrible uh, problem that happened last year with a huge fish kill. Uh, that's more about nutrient runoff uh, from the precipitation events. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Thomas to talk about his research uh, with the crunch research and sea level rise. And um, if you go to this, um, web link here. This is a, a great a web app that Thomas and the FIU GIS department have worked on, uh, which shows some great graphics, which I think you're going to demonstrate, right, Thomas? Yes, Darren, thank you so much. I already started to uh, excellent presentation. I already started to delete uh, some of my slides because it would be just doubling your effort. Hmm. Thank you so much. So I'm, so I'm hoping uh, that gives a good good basis of where we are, and then we can lead into your yeah. research and all the the, the, the the research on on mitigation that you've been uh, working on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. I need to share. One second. So you guys see the, the video screen? Yes, thanks. At the beginning was the hydrogen. Do you see that? Yes, yes. Yeah, so I'm going a couple of decades backwards. I'm going 45 to 50 years backwards and start with hydrogen and would like to discuss research that happened in the European Union before. So this is a map of the Trans cities if we consider that the entire glaciers will melt and it will rise to 70 meters. And most of the cities that you see there in the upper corner and down in the south, including Venezia in Italy, are these project areas of uh, my freelancing work and research as an architect, engineer, and urban planner licensed in Europe. Unfortunately, I have to go back to uh, a situation that, uh, that has accompanied my entire life. And I received in uh, Provenezia Viva stipend in 1978, which I'm uh, showing now here, one second. I hope this, uh, yeah, it's moving. I see that it's moving. So, but I have to go back 
to a kind of a philosophy. So my career started with hands-on manual tools as my father was an artist. And so my relatives, uh, clockmakers, artists, attorneys, construction companies, etc. And this shifted to the time. So through new tools and disruptive technology, I then developed further concepts for intelligent buildings based on my studies at the University of the Arts and in Bremen, by the way, under William Alsop, Neil, as you know him. And then this resulted in, in workflows that deal now with tools that are more digital and not any more hands-on pretty much. And you see there in the middle, one of the ongoing projects of uh, 3D printed additive manufacturing of bridges that are starting right now in Germany and more or less learning tools like uh, in, in Berlin, I started with Python and JavaScript in, in the eighties. Now all these, these uh, workflows have changed and this is a situation in Berlin and you see, when you go back 50, 60 years, the way we grew up, we did not have iPhones. So we, we played with leftovers in the streets and these are pretty much leftovers from uh, uh, residents. And we played with those things. And it's interesting that neurobiologists are more interested in the intelligence of kids during their adolescence and their adaptation to the environment because they are not brainwashed. They are not brain conditioned. And you see the kids, I can pretty much identify myself in this arena. And uh, some of them are C-section careers, which I consider myself as well. And I will elaborate on that later on. Now, I would like to go now into one of my first successes. And I received the European stipend of the Foundation Pro Venezia Viva. And I was 18 years, 19 years old at that time. So I lived and worked for an entire year in, in Venezia to analyze and learn about the foundations and uh, the construction systems, and in particular, the arts. And in, in this journey, I understood that uh, Venezia is built on wooden stems, oak trees, rammed into the swamp, so to speak. And Venezia is sinking. So I experienced in 1978 that uh, I experienced flooding and the storm surge. So literally my, my pants and my shoes went up to eye level in, while I was waking up in the morning. And we know that Venice is sinking one to three millimeter yearly. And Darren already showed the problems with the septic tanks here in Miami. Now imagine how this turns out in, in, in Venezia doing storm searches. And what's interesting is also that we, we have foundations that are impacted through corrosion. And these oak trees are, are in a vacuum. So they are not corroding or rotting as long they are in this H2O water uh, uh, wrapped uh, vacuum. But you see here these corroded skills of sewage pipes and also the foundation is rotting and same issues we have in Miami pretty much. So this was part of my, my very early experience with climate change and, and heat mitigation, adaptation in urban design in very highly densified areas. Now, we do know that uh, the sea barrier that is now developed, the most project, is not qualified to adapt to Florida because we are living literally on a sponge and we have saltwater intrusion into the freshwater aquifer. So the water comes up vertically. Now, let me go back to Berlin. Uh, I grew up in in uh, four zones, pretty much French, English, American, and the Russian zone. So 
walls and boundaries were always part of my uh, my life and my adaptation to the environment. And this was one of the first prizes, the International Schinkel Prize, one of 57 awards that I collected in the last uh, 21 years. And this was this uh, satellite city, uh, Mercus Viertel, that has 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 uh, very high groundwater levels and uh, flooding. So I proposed this concept to include the groundwater table that pressures upwards in, in, in during the rainy season, parts of Mercus Viertel is flooded to develop an architecture and the surrounding area that speaks to it. Now, another competition was uh, the disappearance of the Berlin Wall. Here I proposed an ice wall and used the theory of Paul Virilio, the aesthetics of the disappearance. And uh, <clears throat> created a simulacrum to show that uh, the wall will disappear over time, like climate change is uh, presenting disruptive environments as well. And this was then uh, awarded. And at very early at the University of the Arts, of course, we started to uh, look at the bio-inspired constructions. And it was also at the time of Fryoto. Everyone had to do this. And this was another very strong impact and influence on my work. But at this time, as you see here, these are type machines and, and sketches and calculations that we had to perform at that time because we didn't have the tools as we have them today the generative topological optimization tools where we can huge uh, include huge data sets i can give you two names on the one hand Roland Barthes, which to me is very important and i started from his thought although i consider it totally wrong and on the other hand on the other extreme McLuhan, who proposes an articulated image, which I consider fascistry. I am absolutely against it, but still, it is a point of departure. May I mention a third thinker, Abraham Moll, with whom I, who is a close friend of mine, and with whom I am in almost daily contact, but with whom I tend to disagree more and more. I would like to say the following, if I may. Every revolution, be it political, economic, social, or aesthetic, is in the last analysis a technical revolution. If you look at the big revolution through which mankind has gone, let's say the Neolithic Revolution, or the revolution of the Bronze Age, or the Stone Age, or the, or the Iron Age, or the Industrial Revolution, every revolution is in fact a technical revolution. So is the present one. But there is one difference. So far, techniques have always simulated the body. For the first time, our new techniques simulate the nervous system. So that this is for the first time a really, if you want to say so, a really immaterial and, to use an old term, spiritual revolution. I think that it is important to say this in your context. So these are Wilhelm Flusser's theories and uh, the French philosopher Jean Baudrillard and Jacques Derrida had a huge influence on our work in Berlin as we almost every week, three or four times, had political demonstrations against the government and the situation that already occurred at that time with climate change and um, inequality in society. So I started then <clears throat> to, to take on gravel pit architecture and put industrial green blue infrastructures throughout Germany, looking at gravel pits. And this was then uh, uh, presented in the AEDES gallery at that time at Bahnhof So, because Berlin was still divided in, into four sectors. And I was on the West sector. Now, the political influence also including Paul Virilio's theories of uh, existentialism and uh, attacking Heidegger and others, also questioned the understanding of space 
going away from the Cartesian space into a more liquid space that doesn't have the Cartesian co coordinates because in the liquid space, you do not have a, a floor or a wall or a, a basement. It's an open space. So the, the, the liquid architecture or the liquid environment became more and more dominating. And I'm scrolling here now the, the video a little bit faster. So I was looking at thousands of travel pits along the River Rhine and created an inventory with photographs and videos and putting sensor infrastructures in those areas and then proposed to the cement and concrete industry and others transformation concepts that people live could live and work in these uh, in these holes in the landscape that are flooded by groundwater and through the season the rainy season of course flooded as well neighboring uh, others in industrial facilities and one of the <clears throat> most famous concepts that was then realized is the cement factory transformation in Bailam Rhine at the border to Swiss and France. And very close is, uh, are the first Saharditz buildings, Vitra, the, the fire station. And in this area, the Landesgartenschau uh, facility also designed by Saharditz at that time. And I remember uh, very well uh, her colleagues when they showed up here on the Landesgartenschau. And this is the transformation of this facility. This facility had in the past about 150 workers. Now, nowadays, Gravel Pit or any industrial facility has only two, three. And uh, mostly they have digital twins and they run through building automation systems are controlled with drones and sensor infrastructures, entire processes like this. Now, the interest in bio-inspired workflows and design continued, so I, um, published and, and researched more and more at the university. I became a professor when I was 32 years old, actually, at the University of Kaiserslautern, and then later on uh, in Hannover and in Leipzig, before I then moved in 1999 to the United States. Resulting out of these gravel pit architectures were then recycled and reused building components off the grid, one of the first, I would say worldwide, or at least in the European Union, that have been built completely off the grid and powered with renewable energy systems that are still running today. And uh, sewage treatment running through a uh, bio treatment, uh, uh, conversion, cogeneration systems to power uh, the building or rainwater, gray water, brown water collection and treatment with living machines. And these projects then fed into worldwide publications, which opened up then more commissions and more research. This is the, the cover of the architectural review, for example. And uh, this is the, the building itself with recycled industrial components and uh, composed in a way that it runs off the grid, so to speak, carbon positive. I was then in good neighborhood uh, with uh, contemporary European architects, Ben van Berkel, Kurt Himmelblau, Forster, Herzberger, John Well, interested in the typology of this emerging, emerging ecologically radical designs that stem from post-industrial areas. And many, many other uh, publications followed, leading also in the US to the Design Vanguard Award in 2003, which is uh, pretty much uh, honoring the entire the oeuvre of uh, post-industrial infrastructural landscape, urban designs, and, and architectural typologies. Then I was involved in the exhibition at the Kuba Hewitt, Hewitt uh, National Design Museum in 1988 to present uh, concepts of photovoltaics that are in remote areas off the grid for building materials, communications, 
irrigation systems, medical equipment, satellites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And another major research happened, and I left this now running. International awarded. Is uh, is this uh, research called climate climate uh, climate klima Werkzeug Architektur in German, meaning intelligent buildings, which was also influenced by Paul Virilio's uh, theories. And we see here the coastal flooding which is going to happen in Hamburg in 2100 based on the atmospheric carbon dioxide that Darren already showed in, in, in uh, very strong and straightforward images, slides before, I don't have to repeat that anymore. And this led then to these kind of uh, typologies and publications. So we built this mock-up mock uh, models and uh, equipped them equipped them with uh, Hobo and other Siemens uh, specific sensors to test them in the wind tunnel and in the aquarium. And, and uh, you see here, we also worked with uh, scientists from the University of Kaiserslautern in Germany that are specializing experts on hydraulic engineering to understand much better the adaptation of these buildings to the sites in different European uh, locations. You see here uh, pages, excerpts from the publication, low tide, high tide, king tide, storm surge architecture that hydraulically adapts to the level of the water. We included also uh, river uh, flows that let uh, be, uh, these buildings on water float and adapt to rising uh, water levels. Then uh, this researcher here looked at even submarine type of, of uh, communities underwater and calculated the entire complex, the entire society, how much food, renewable energy sources, oxygen, etc. they need. It's pretty much the, the concept flying to Mars, but here underwater was part of this uh, research. And here we have then these maps as well included how the River Rhine is flooding major parts of the European Union from Basel, Switzerland, pretty much from the Alps towards the Netherlands and how they are impacting residential, commercial, infrastructure, recreation, agricultural, etc. areas. And this research that has been conducted in 1990 to 1992 and later on feeds pretty much into the crunch Miami research today. And it's extremely helpful. We see here, these are the industrial areas in the rural valleys. And it's like, uh, it's the same situation like in, in New Orleans. The, the River Rhine is, is mostly higher than the surrounding parts because the, the industrial area and the villages are sinking in the rural valley, not just because of undermining coal uh, extraction and sinkholes, but also the the land itself is, is built on, on a sponge as well in parts of it, rock and sponge. So this led to the International Building Exhibition Entra Park competition phase between 1990 and 1999. There were 120 separate projects developed, mostly based on competitions. And I won, I would say 12 of them with uh, colleagues from landscape architecture and engineering to redevelop and fiber remediate, clean up industrial sites and develop concepts for connecting the disconnected industrial and villages and towns with each other through new green, blue urban infrastructures and transportation systems. This is a project in Oberhausen, a first prize, which is the transformation of a former coke battery and coal mining area with adjacent industries. And this became, or is already one of the Ruhr in Love event parks where millions of people every year 
do their techno stages in other festivities. So as you see here, this is a highly um, occupied and uh, celebrated site of post-industrial transformation, as we can see. And also between 2012 and 2014, I was involved with the, the office Peter Trecker in Bottrop, Berlin, Hannover, to, together with, which is interesting, uh, Albert Speer, son, Speer and partner of Frankfurt and others to develop this innovation city rural model, city Bottrop concept to achieve climate responsive innovation guidelines, distribute them, implement them, and uh, reduce CO2 emissions by 50% by 2020. I think we failed. We only achieved 40%. So more work needs to be done. And then I was um, involved in the East part after the wall came down and through my professorship in, uh, in Hannover and then East Germany in Leipzig to develop these uh, visions for these uh, gigantic coal mining mega steel bridges, 1,990 feet long, 262 feet high, and uh, to develop concepts how they can be occupied and programmed through the four seasons. The, you see here these uh, are Maya and uh, 3D Max uh, simulations that then later were fed into CATIA workflows to make these uh, implementations uh, uh, possible. And uh, the concept is also to, to, to mitigate these uh, thousands of holes in the landscape that have been dicked by the, the coal mining decade in East Germany to let them uh, flood and try to remediate them and include these uh, mega bridges into the concept of uh, transformation and, and occupation. Then I also was involved in, in many, many uh, bridges that I engineered and designed. And I want to show you this one. This is uh, the International Suspension Steelwood Bridge awarded design for the World Expo in 2000 of the Park of the Census in, in Hannover. Uh, curved suspension bridge. And uh, this is another bridge over the Mars in, in Belgium. I received the first prize together with uh, Ingomar Belz and uh, Harry Reinberger, both engineers as well. And uh, second place was Santiago Calatrava, who got the second prize. But today, as you see here, these uh, workflows have changed completely. 21 years ago, we did not have these tools that we have today. So here we see these uh, 3D printed additive manufacturing workflows. This is done here in Autodesk Inventor and Fusion with generative design and topo topological optimization workflows through the cloud for a couple of bridges that are in commission right now in uh, Germany. And this disruptive change of technologies that is now also influencing my teaching in environmental systems and in, uh, in the sustainability studio as well in, in, in the elective studio. This is a work of uh, some students that are looking at high rise structures and uh, using generative topological optimization workflows in these uh, Autodesk uh, uh, cloud computed uh, platforms. And they come up with this uh, highly optimized uh, structures that uh, can be further optimized into filigree to reduce the 3D printing hours as they are very expensive to use the rods per hour. And uh, the lighter the systems are, and you see on the right side, the material uh, optimizations to bring it down to 20% by each um, workflow. Also, I was involved in many, many housing projects. This is uh, in, uh, in Southwest Germany, in Freiburg, townhouses that are net zero energy or low energy and published in building a new millennium, Taschen Verlag. I'm also here in good neighborhood, Laduando, uh, Arata, Isozaki, 
Richard Rogers, Sean Well, etc., Paul Kimmerblau, uh, Chipperfield. Then uh, these projects uh, are uh, timber and platform framing housing, pre manufactured, completely pre manufactured, with sub assembly systems modules, and then erected in a couple of days. Also, uh, solar powered. I received the uh, first prize for that, the German Solar Prize. Then uh, following lectures at the Rice Design Alliance, at the Museum of Fine Arts and Museum, with Kane Young, by the way, also on the panel. And uh, research with the Fraunhofer Institute in Leipzig at that time, researching on transparent insulations, which is, which is uh, adapted from polar ice bears and uh, melting glaciers using the reflectancies and properties for thermal insulation. At this time in the, in the 90s, we used trances for decoding and scripting and programming, a very high sophisticated workflow. It's not open source, it's very expensive. So it's still in the market and uh, it can still be embedded in building information modeling uh, workflows. Here work with uh, uh, Berlin with air quality modeling that uh, led to uh, publications about towards zero energy urban areas, suburban growth and environmental racism in the US because if you look at GIS data sets, you see that, that the poorest people are mostly surrounded uh, uh, of um, uh, brownfields and industrial facilities with no public transportation. Then uh, this is the work of uh, Alfredo Andia, also an FIU colleague in mine, to look at post parametric automation in design and construction. This uh, publication was done in 2014, which is all about disruptive technology and changes. So we conducted a dozen of uh, interviews with uh, big players in, in the world market in, um, in terms of algorithmic and uh, AI. Uh, uh, powered uh, workflows in, 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 in uh, architecture and engineering offices. And I have here some uh, examples. I worked with the CQC Heim in Tokyo, an automated fabrication assembly line with uh, Furusu and uh, Cardano. Uh, these uh, big manufacturing facilities, they are completely robotized. They, they work with robots. You can order like a Dell computer, the systems based on square meters and your building will be fabricated in two days. It's based on a modular grid of assemblies and the bill of, of parts. Then I worked with Siemens, looking at self-learning factories and automation, optimization via genetic algorithms, particular genetic algorithms, GAs, neural networks, wasp swarm optimization of logistic systems and automation systems. Then uh, this one is a project in Catalina, island uh, close to Los Angeles that I performed and conducted with Mark Bernstein at that time. He was a professor at USC in political science, very good speaker and uh, heavily involved worldwide in many, many of these projects. And I was in charge to develop an, an off the grid uh, infrastructure for Carolina Island to make it uh, sustainable or let's say carbon positive. And also here, we use the GIS data and uh, computational workflows available at that time to come up with these concepts and benchmark them. And then I'm just going a little bit faster, not to forget the solar decathlons, which are buildings that or houses that compete for live work environments against other comp computational uh, competitive contributions of other universities. I worked with Pittsburgh at the Center for Building Performance and Diagnostic in uh, at Carnegie Mellon, Los Angeles, USC, Miami, FIU, with Mary Lees and uh, Camilo Rosales, Shahin Vasik, the projects in Miami. And here we see uh, uh, the Tsinghua University in, in China, and uh, Mary Lees and I, and uh, with the Chinese professors and students when we competed, uh, competed in the solar decathlon China in 2013. This was also accompanied with uh, research uh, uh, that I did uh, 
at the Tsinghua University. I visited Beijing many times. And uh, most recently, I'm uh, working with uh, architects in Costa Rica, in New York, and in Rwanda, in uh, Kigali, in Africa, on this uh, 40 hectare carbon neutral uh, new city uh, neighborhood. And uh, I'm in charge of the carbon neutral energy water infrastructural systems. And here you see a master diagram. I had to black out the names because it's uh, signed on a non disclosure agreement. And I'm also in charge uh, of biomass and uh, loads, etc., photovoltaics. And what's interesting is here, let me uh, run this for a moment, is in 2018, already we have access to these uh, computational workflows. They solely lie happen in the cloud with Energy Plus and DO2 engines. And here we have a plugin in the building information workflow of, of Revit and Inventor and, and, and Infra, uh, Infra Works as well, Nevis Works. This is called Cove, and uh, this is running with a uh, generative algorithm. Some say it's a narrow AI that is behind, and it has over 50,000 combinations. And these unique combinations, they help us to speed up the process. So, work that I have done about 30 years ago is now accelerated in, into seconds and minutes. Work that I have done with colleagues, engineers and urban planners, etc., that has taken half a year is now done in minutes, in five, 10 minutes, depending on the, the, the CPU of, of, of the, the, the cloud computers. And then uh, we, we are receiving these, uh, these uh, flow charts and we can go from envelope set points and schedules, interior finishes, structures into costing and life cycle and look at the bundles and update our workflows accordingly. We can also in integrate many, many of these uh, benchmarking systems. So this last project I wanna show here before I then go to our Miami project. And I hope this gives you a good baseline to understand the, the context is the Nueva Asamblea Legislativa project in San Jose, Costa Rica. It's a hundred million dollar uh, a governmental building that I uh, was uh, consulting and, and helping to, to turn it into a carbon neutral operation. I was invited after the design was done. So I had to fix, I was pretty much an, an ambulance to fix the problems with daylight and, and uh, thermal performances, computational fluid dynamics to make sure it works. And you see on the left side, the former president of Costa Rica, he visited FIU and uh, I took the chance to go to the stage and talk to him about this project along with uh, uh, Rosenberg. So for this project, I used uh, methods like the Takuchi regression and design of experiment algorithms to check the solar transmittance, natural ventilation and the ratio of glazing to wall for daylight. And uh, these are computational workflows with Autodesk uh, CFD and ANSYS to develop uh, natural ventilation systems to avoid uh, too much humidity, to dehumidify with uh, active systems and uh, create uh, these uh, louver systems that are fully automated with uh, Siemens our building automation systems. I was also in charge to develop uh, uh, Helio start systems to bring daylight deep down into the floors, to the basement, into the offices to redirect. You see there are a dynamo uh, workflows and coding and scripting. And all this always is accompanied with uh, in situ in inspections. So, okay. And uh, yeah, this is the last one. I was also involved in, in uh, with uh, Intelligent Europe. This was a, a major fund to do training for sustainability in resource energy efficiency in uh, higher education at universities in the Caribbean higher education institutes and also to do training for architects and engineers and urban planners. And it pretty much included the, the region of the Caribbean with uh, pleasant flights there and uh, doing workshops and, and learning about these islands and their problems with climate change 
heat mitigation and sea level rise and storm searches. And of course, I was always involved in uh, these uh, computational fuel dynamics, looking at hospitals and surgery spaces for agent-based design and machine learning, how to improve surgery rooms in hospitals. My wife works in, in the Jackson system in the surgery um, environment, and they're all using robots pretty much and uh, gen style and, and, and so on. Okay, so let's uh, close this and go quickly to our FIU project. One second. And get that moving. One second. Doesn't very good. This works. Okay, share the screen. Can I get feedback? What do you see? Yeah, that's Hello. great. We can see it. That's great. Yeah. So now we are arriving in Miami. Finally, we are arriving in Miami. So much has been said by uh, Albert Elias and colleagues then in the last presentations last week I was uh, really touched by Roberto Rovira and uh, Craig Reed and in particular Philip Stoddard's presentation with his uh, scenario of having 50 meters uh, as soon as possible at 2050, 2100 if I'm correct if uh, the melting of the glaciers continues. So we do know that uh, entire South Florida is uh, floating on a sponge pretty much. And you see here all these pumping systems. I can talk for days just about the pumping systems and the dams and how much non-renewable energy those systems use to artificially keep Florida alive artificially in terms of by, by using non-renewable energy, fossil energy, which is exactly the trigger why we have an increase of greenhouse gases so dramatically. It's like shooting in your foot. It's unbelievable. So this is happening. This is how we operate our cities in uh, Florida. And not to forget the entire urban infrastructure. And Philip Stoddard already laid that out in the last presentation last week, is built on concrete and, and, and related materials that are corroding. You see here, uh, salt water corrodes the concrete and we have collapsing infrastructures, leaking infrastructures and con collapsing foundations that we, that we have to consider. And, and we are built on a sponge. So the salt water in intrusion means that the fresh water aquifer get impacted and the groundwater pressure pressures upwards. And if sea level rises and storm surge kicks in, let's think about the Doring event with 30, uh, 26 feet, meaning that these structures will even be more impacted by corrosion. Now, our entire infrastructure is based on these bridges. We are connecting islands to islands with this infrastructure for sewage, water. In the water itself, we have uh, telecommunication and, and other media funneling and connecting through uh, the islands. And the sewage itself is uh, pumped and per gravity pumped down to Biscayne, to the Biscayne treatment facility that has an outpost of, of sewage, I believe three to five kilometers into the ocean. And that environmental impact comes straight back to the, to the beaches of the tourists. So the question is here, and we saw that already in Darren's uh, excellent presentation, are we retreating, defending or attacking? Where are we going? What is the best solution? Now, for a researcher or architect, engineer, urban planner like me, it is very important to have 
to include all the senses to understand from an eye level in the water by doing scuba diving, looking at all these islands that are witnesses of environmental pollution, human trash that ends up in, 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 uh, in Biscayne Bay to understand better the relationship. So here, last year, I wanna bring this in. Last year, I was uh, very much impacted with skin rash. I also had a E. coli case. I had to be treated in the Sinai hospital because I'm kayaking weekly, at least two, three times per week. And by this kind of direct interface with king tide, low tide, storm surges, or mass fish killings, you get a much better idea what are the problems with runoffs, leaking septic tanks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also to see how the mangroves itself adapt to this environment step by step. And you see here, this is uh, Warsaw Island. You see here a panorama image. Here we see a low tide situation. And you see the mangroves, part of the mangroves and the existing trees, how the roots are adapting to this situation. And this is very interesting. This is the research we are currently doing in our, in our research studios to look at uh, these kind of bio-inspired structural systems and using generative topological optimization workflows in um, Autodesk Fusion Inventor, um, Ameba and 3D Caramba, which is the grasshopper site, to come up with solutions. Last year, I was invited uh, as a keynote speaker and uh, panelist at the European version of computer-aided architectural design, ECAT, in, in Berlin. You see here uh, one of my colleagues. And uh, this brings me now to the climate resilient urban nexus choices for carbon neutral city scenarios research called Crunch, which uh, is aiming towards an integrated decision support system for scenarios between 2019 and 2100, whereas the GIS data sets are all based on 2018. It's a $1.9 million funded EU Belmont Horizon 2020 Suchi US National Science Foundation project that uh, includes urban living labs in uh, London, Eindhoven, Dansk, and Poland, Uppsala, Sweden, Scotland, Taipei, Taiwan, and us in Miami. So, looking at these uh, integrated design indicators for green blue infrastructures and the area of food nexus, water nexus, energy nexus, and well being in compact cities. And all this is based on uh, indicators and protocols of the United Nations Sustainable Development and ISO 37122 standards. And of course, based on the Paris 2015 COP21 climate. Now, this research has gone through over 30 meetings, probably more if we include the Caribbean area and the areas in uh, Asia and Europe. In particular, we have uh, research team members from FIU GIS computer department. We have 19 international, national, and local exhibitions and publications. ECAT Berlin 2020, Venice Biennale in September, then AIA in downtown this April and May, the International Union of Architects in Rio de Janeiro in May as well. Over 180 students participated in the crunch design scenarios from 2018 to 2021. The best design research scenarios are published by Franco Angeli, Milano, Rutledge, and uh, in many journals and proceedings worldwide. And here you see the, the volumes, urban hybrids, uh, volume two, net zero high rises, carbon positive in volume three, 2020, 2021. But let me explain to you now the, the workflow before I then open the, the IDSS app itself and explain how it, it's going to work. And then the last thing is we are going to show a video scenario, it's five minutes. 
of the best uh, scenarios we have developed so far. So we uh, develop an ND platform for integrated carbon neutral nexus design solutions and green blue infrastructures, which starts with GIS data to look at urban growth models, existing data repositories, material libraries, GIS data, vector data, feed that into building information modeling using Originally, we're using um, uh, Revit BIN, InfraWorks 360, City Engine, IGIS Pro, looking at vegetation, drainage, topography, bathymetry, and others. This then fed into machine learning algorithms, narrow AI clouds from Green Building Studio, Inside 360, uh, uh, Dynamo, Grasshopper, Python, SpaceMaker, it's not listed here, SpaceMaker are using currently. Geopanta libraries, and more or less now uh, the, the Autodesk Synthetic Biology Cyberboard coding with a molecular modular to look at bio-inspired systems. And as a result, then this goes into interactive UIs for mobile apps, et cetera, that are geocoded for the citizens. So what you see on the left side is pretty much for trained experts, engineers, architects, building automation engineers, et cetera, et cetera. And everything to the left here, this is for the citizens, for the guy around the corner, so to speak, to, to use the tool itself. It, it runs uh, on uh, uh, core software, grid software and GPU accelerators. We have now access, hopefully, to the University of Florida $90 million GPU and uh, to run more complex simulations in, in, in the future. So very important is to say that uh, this, this rapid energy modeling calculations had to be done because FBL is more or less a private entity and they did not release any data or complete data to us to have a baseline for Miami Beach and the city of South Miami. So we literally had to uh, assemble the data and uh, process it through GIS and the, the tax appraisals office, et cetera, et cetera, into these uh, cheap XML or XML spreadsheets. And I must say without Darren's dedication and unbelievable stamina, to get those numbers processed in his team of, of crunch, it would have not been possible. So thank you, Darren. And interesting is we uh, validated the data difference to the summary result of FBL. FBL only gave us the summaries and we were only a plus minus difference of 5.94 or 6% difference, which is amazing in research. And here you see pretty much the the workflows for city of Miami Beach. This was done in the Autodesk InfraWorks through uh, Navis Works, building information modeling, Revit, and, and, and other workflows. So we used the, the, the color coding of the future land use categories for the color coding of this three, four, five, six, seven D InfraWork model, and the same for the city of South Miami. And uh, this is uh, an example of Darren's uh, work, so he compared the situation in the city of Miami with the US national average and the World Health Organization in terms of water usage, gallons of water. And you see the city of Miami Beach is around 102,051 compared to the world average 9,643 or the US national average. It's almost three times more than the US average. And the same is pretty much true for the electricity, kilowatt electricity, city of Miami Beach average is 12,000 kilowatt electricity of UK national average is four. So that's one sixth of what Miami Beach is uh, using. And the same for the, the tons of CO2. Now our goal in our research is to get to zero, zero. So with that, I'm going to, explain the the IDDS S app and probably I'm just closing this and going to the app itself 
share again, one second. Can I get please feedback? What do you see? Yeah, that's great. Crunch, yeah. Yeah, good. So this is the, the official Crunch web page. And please, please, it's a work in progress template. It's not finished. We are still working on this. There's, there are thousands, if not millions of variables and uh, hundreds of protocols we have to go through. So what we see here is, is the interface. This is the video that I'm going to show you later on, the disruptive AI data driven carbon positive bio inspired optimization workflows. But more important is let's have a look at the beta version of the integrated design tool. Uh, are you seeing uh, this uh, design tool? Does Zoom allow us to see it? Yes. Yep. Good. Now, First step is always to select the 3D. So the, the wish here is the goal, not just to say the dream depends on, on the budgets, how many scientists and uh, team members you can hire, is to have a, an interactive tool, an integrated decision tool for professionals, but also for citizens so that they can use the app on their iPhones or on their iPad, and it's going to be geocoded. So wherever they are, they can run these simulations. And what's interesting here is we have a breakdown of energy, which is based on the baseline of 2018 at the moment. So all the renewable energy systems that are possible are already computed. And you see, we have the CO2 emissions for, for uh, Miami Beach. You can also go to South Miami, the city of South Miami, you will see the same. And the PV potentials, energy consumption as of today. And what, what has not been populated is solar thermal, geothermal, heat exchangers, wind energy, ocean energy. Then we have the food, the food uh, parameters for urban outdoor farming in tons per year, indoor farming and agricultural resiliency in square meter tons per, per year. This is going to be a workflow where, we're, where we are saying that, that uh, we will have to feed the population in that zip code based boundary to avoid transportation energy, transportation uh, greenhouse gases caused by having food from, from outside areas. So food farming should happen outdoor, indoor within the zip codes. Here is the water consumption, carbon sequestration will here be uh, populated. We have the demography, affected population, the ethnicity breakdown, the property values in, in billions, facilities which are uh, representing the service economy, hospital, police stations, schools, gas stations. Soon we'll have here uh, charging stations for, for e-transportation, e-cars, e-trucks, e-SUVs, etc electrical substation and land use. And then relative extent of flooding for public, semi-public recreation, residential, retail, vacant, etc. And here the, the disclaimers, distribution of flooded areas, roads, systems. And of course, a new section is pandemic, where we bring in uh, RMA, pandemic uh, uh, statistics, hopefully interactive. So we can see how our area is, uh, is uh, impacted. Then land use, roads, pandemic again. And let's just go to demography. So here in the demography, we have these sliders of sea level rise. So sea level rise, two feet, four feet, five feet, six feet, seven feet, eight feet. And you see the impact, affected population 100%. Entire Miami Beach is flooded almost. Some of the beach area and some of the, 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 the richer part of Miami Beach is uh, still above ground, but Fisher Island is flooded as well. And then we have here storm surge, category one, category two, category four. And you see all the breakdowns here, you know, the affected areas. So if I go back to category one and uh, Bring it down to two to, to zero feet, but we get flooding. You see, these are the affected areas. 
So we give us statistics and information that the government and the politicians, depending on what side, are not giving us. So this tool is a, a participatory democracy driven apparatus, a tool as Willem Flusser mentioned it in the 90s, who has influenced my work and the works of a million others, that we are seeking a participatory, participatory democracy by using an apparatus that is accessible 24 hours, 365 days. Now, you see also here the land use, how it's impacted. So the next step is that we are going to add, do you see the mouse, Neil? Yes, yes. Yeah, we are going to add here uh, a sectional tool. Why a sectional tool? Because people do not understand two-dimensional or three-dimensional pigeon or seagull perspectives when you show that Miami Beach is flooded. You, we are going to add here sections that are synchronized with these sliders to show us how a street section geocoded with the building and the users, the population is flooded over time. So with that, I have to close this very quickly and go back to the presentation. And then we are looking at the five minutes video and then we are done. Then we can have a discussion. So, so please give me feedback. What do you see? I can see, uh, yeah, I can see the screen. Yeah, great. Yeah, so here, this is the, the section slider that we are going to include. And it's expressed in millimeters because millimeters, remember when we looked at uh, Venezia and Italy, Venezia is sinking one to, to three millimeters per year. And actually the same is uh, happening to parts of Florida. We are also subsiding slightly in millimeters. So while we are subsliding, not talking about sinkholes or collapsing uh, corroded uh, building infrastructures and high rises, talking about millimeters gives us a much better idea what is going to happen. If you talk about feet, we are just not uh, telling the truth and we, are, we just can't get the, the attention and the participation of the citizens, the concerned citizens. So we see here 2070, 2100, and uh, the Dorian storm surge that happened in uh, 2019 in the Bahamas with the category five, that one was targeting towards Miami. And I remember Darren and I, we, we communicated with the iPhones, very anxious if it's coming or not. But Dorian stayed for three days in the Bahamas and played at the entire island and killed thousands of people. So if we have a Dorian storm surge, you see, it almost reaches to the second floor. And if we add the six feet to eight feet NOAA and NASA projections for 2100, an event like the Dorian storm surge would be then up to the third floor. There's just no, no way to survive. That's why in all our designs and proposals and protocols, we are suggesting a, a master plan building code that starts with an infrastructure and an ac access and departure level of 30 feet for the low lying areas in Miami Dade and the Crater Islands, if not for the entire world. And here down here, you see on the, on the right side where my mouse is hoovering. So these are the transportation concepts. And on the right side, this is a, an open foam computational fluid dynamic project that I'm doing together with uh, Theodorus Galanos. We're working on this right now to simulate not just Hurricane 5 impact on these new building structures on, on stilts, but also using a slime mold techniques to connect these new high rises with new infrastructures. So this is still cooking and in, 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 uh, in a process. So, and this is our scenario as we see it of the day. So just imagine we have at the moment around 90,000 uh, people population in Miami Beach. 
And we're going to do the same for the city of South Miami. And on the left side, you see the millimeters of sea level rise with the events of like category five, Dorian, et cetera. So around 2040, salt water will corrode the foundations and putting buildings at risk, they might collapse. Then we have uh, major uh, pollution in Biscayne Bay and in flooded areas of uh, Miami-Dade of low-lying areas. It is time then to raise the buildings with hydraulic systems, those who will survive to develop a green blue infrastructure increase that uh, adapt to this new sea level rise. But the population drops, drops to 45,000 approximately in just in Miami Beach zip code based. And what Darren already said, no one talks about retreat. The retreat will happen. It will happen and Philip Stoddard also laid out that the service economy will collapse and uh, it is time to come up with new visions and, and, and uh, scenarios how a service economy also for the poor can be provided. Then looking to 2070, we will have again a race to 180,000 uh, uh, population because we have more and more buildings on, on, on stills that are hydraulically adaptable and adapt to uh, sea level rise as it's predicted up here on the right side by NOAA and NASA and others and IBBC. So why the scenarios 2021 to 2040 to 2070 to 2100? Because we cannot have for every year a scenario that would mean we need another $10 million to conduct all the research and feed, feed the research and the data compensatories into the GIS and narrow AI cloud uh, platforms to compute those numbers. That's just simply no time. So the app will then have these uh, coded projects. So this is a project from uh, Sufar from Morocco, a former student, he graduated. He looked at the ocean drive, it's already elevated and the transportation transportation system is elevated. And we are building new structures over the existing ones. Or here, these are mangrove in green blue infrastructures that, that will be placed in this area. And these are the new high rises that we see. Okay, and now let's go to the, the last part, which is a five minutes uh, video. Neil, do we still have time? Yeah, we do. But uh, if you could avoid any 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 sound, any music, because it gets blocked by YouTube. Yeah, I will. We had the same problem in uh, in Berlin. We had the uh, YouTube protocols and uh, limitations, but then the German ones kicked in as well, which made it even worse. Okay, good. This works on my side. And now I need your feedback. What do you see? Yeah, we could see now a kind of a, a, a mangroves. Yeah. And now you should see the, the NT platform again, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, the concept of living shorelines proposed by also by Darren, a beautiful, excellent Adobe InDesign. But the point here is we have to understand that kids born in uh, 2018, 2019, they are the ones that will experience these dramatic changes of sea level rise, storm surge, and the melting of, of uh, glaciers. And that also includes that the heat uh, impact will increase. So heat islands will be another big problem. problem. So it is, it is absurd that we have the tools today, we can compute these, these processes, we can inform citizens and planners, and we can have this participatory scenario and, and, and imagining uh, ways of thinking about retreat and adapting to the environment. We can access these uh, open data in terms of further imagining uh, scenarios that deal with the future. And this is the interesting part in, in, this, uh, in this research project. 
that we have young students in our research teams and they have kids. I have four kids, for example, they are 25, 30, the oldest, and now I'm becoming a grandpa, but these are the kids that will experience climate change, heat increase, water scarcity. So we need to look at new typologies. And what you see here are these tools that we didn't have 30 years ago, but now we have them. Computational flight, flight, fluid dynamics. We can look at uh, humidity buildups in buildings based on pressure and temperature velocities. We can, we can uh, geocode with virtual reality, augmented reality, more and more these situations on certain coordinates, how they will be impacted over time. Then we have uh, programmable matter. We, we are writing life, we are coding life, we are, we are scripting. It's not just by our mimicry, by copying, we are now able to, to, to write life. And this where synthetic biology comes in. And uh, I'm in a, in, a, in a research involved with Autodesk the, the genetic code uh, programmable uh, software tool, which is also my hypothesis for my dissertation at the university in Genoa, which is finished, I hope so in two years. And this is work from Alfredo Andia, who, with who uh, I have uh, not just published the book, uh, Post-Parametric Automation, but also run a studio with him. And here you see the Autodesk research with uh, Molucra Modeler. This is a poster for the Venice Finale. Actually, this was uh, developed by, by me and, and Darren, and Darren uh, did the finishing. Here, this is a simulation from a master thesis students three years ago, Sadiel Oyeda. He looked at Miami Beach already flooded in 2100, and new typologies are in evolving, adapting, and uh, the facade systems are multi-layered, control daylight, convert energy into growing cells. Islands are adapting to the, to the rise of sea level because it's programmable matter. Then here, these are studio projects and I'm not commenting on the studio projects if they are bad or good or, or fantasy. These are, these are done by students that study at FIU architecture and go through our courses. And this is their imagination, how they see the future of uh, South Florida or maybe other cities. Because today, what is possible, we can just simply change the weather file or the weather file station of these designs in the building information or ABS modeling platform. And then all the the, the skins, the infrastructure system, adapt automatically to these uh, data sets. And then we run it through cloud computation and optimize it to the, to the site. So I would say, looking back for three years, Darren and Neil, I feel so blessed and I feel so happy be part of this because having an, an army of uh, researchers and, and students and just going back 30 years to enable this kind of imaginations is just unbelievable helpful. And I want to go beyond the age of 100 if possible. I have uh, a, a guy in contact that is, uh, he's 103. He's called the Marathon, the Marathon Turbo, Turbo Marathon. He's uh, living in London and he ran marathon, marathons until he was 103 years old. And he's a vegetarian. So he's my role model. Because then if I go over 100, I will experience these changes. And I want to be part of it. I'm not sure if I still can kayak and scuba drive, but it, maybe it's possible. As you're riding life, maybe someone is going to invent cocktails of pills or treatments to extend lifetime. Thank you. Th thanks, thanks, Thomas. Um, 
let's uh let's open up to questions um i should say that i, I don't know if I, I was that infrared i saw there thomas i i should mention that theodore theodore Skolanis is is working with thomas uh teaching in the studio right now was that infrared that was no that is open foam so okay. this is a computational fluid dynamic uh platform and we used um we run two uh, two processes. I'm, I, I'm the Autodesk guy in the studio, and Theodorus is the the, the Rhino grass, grasshopper guy. You know, and uh, we're using their uh, open foam. And and on my side, Autodesk Ansys, and and ah, here's Theodorus. And I must say, thank you, Neil, for making this possible. I I just I don't know what to say. I just enjoy so much to work to work with Theodorus and. I wish we would have the European model of semesters. You know, Patrick Schumacher said that, you know, when he talked about uh, that he likes this kind of two semesters through the entire year. Now, what do we have? We have three, three semesters in the US. You can't hardly finish a project. I would love to have a one year studio project with Theodorus, you know, and just fitness test all these workflows because most of them don't work. And there's a lot of troubleshooting involved. But having, having these troubleshooting sessions is very uh, helpful. And Darren, of course, too. I mean, Darren, uh, coming from the music uh, and performance industry and having, you know, caught up so fast these workflows shows how talented these guys are. So um, let's let's open up up to questions. I I mean one thing I mean, just one just I I hope I didn't miss this, Darren. But I want to ask you this question. This it seems to me this wall that is being proposed is extraordinary. You know the the, the I mean apart from the fact it wouldn't work because the the, the substratum the, the is 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 porous. Uh, are there any visual? I mean, how how high is that wall again? And are there any visualizations of it? I. I just yeah, I didn't it. mention that, so I'll, I'll just bring, bring, bring everyone up to speed. But the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, conducted a study called the Back Bay uh, Study in Miami, and it was to look at um, uh, the impacts of storm surge from hurricanes uh, in addition to sea level rise. And what they have proposed is to wall off the city and neighborhoods uh, in a, I guess in a similar way to New Orleans, but um, at some points these walls would reach 34 feet. Um, and as you can imagine, um, well, my municipality for one, Miami Shores, is, is working against this. You know, they do not want this to happen. Um, this would be uh, walls uh, surrounding certain communities, uh, really, uh, it would require a lot of, um, I, I guess, eminent domain um, uh, purchase of land uh, uh, just to, to build these structures. And like you say, this just, uh, it's surprising because we, we are on a limestone uh, uh, bedrock here. So it's, it's a very porous um, uh, foundation on, on which we're sitting. So the problem with that is the percolation of water back up through the limestone as sea level ri rises. And I can give you a, 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 a very real example of this. Um, so when I was building uh, my house here in Miami Shores, um, we, uh, we are not on a sewer system in this municipality. So we use um, on-site sewage treatment, which is a septic system which you know, has been used for centuries all, all, all over the world uh, and works well. Um, so when uh, we had the pool dug in the back, we went down to about eight feet, perfectly fine sand, everything the pool was put in. Uh, we then had Hurricane Irma happen that year, I think it was 2017. This was three days of onshore wind for, for Miami, it was quite an extended event. Normally a hurricane comes in quite quickly and it's over with within, uh, within a, a matter of hours really. But what tends to be happening now as, as the atmosphere is, is warming, um, we're getting much more uh, slower moving hurricanes. Hurricanes that stall because there are no steering patterns in the upper atmosphere, they, those have all shifted. So we've had, we've had situations like, uh, 
the hurricane over Houston, which sat there for three or four days, just dumping rainfall and causing massive flooding in Houston. We had Hurricane Dorian sitting over the Bahamas for, for 48 hours as a category five, which is just things that have just, we just haven't experienced before. Uh, and if that had happened over Miami, I don't think we would be, uh, be in a situation right now where we would, would be fully recovered. With Irma, we had three days of a slow moving category five major hurricane coming up from the south through the Keys, heading up the, the west coast very, very slowly, which caused three days from Friday to, uh, to the Monday of on, very strong onshore winds. We had category one winds, even though the, the hurricane was hundreds of miles off coming onshore uh, uh, um, in the Miami-Dade area. So this caused a huge uh, pileup of water just against the shoreline continuously, continuously, continuously. So two weeks after that storm had passed, we were digging the, 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 the drain field for the septic system down four feet and we hit water. And of course that, uh, all kinds of tremendous uh, uh, kind of regulatory things to, to set in motion because a drain field needs at least three or four feet to, to actually work properly. And we had already hit water. So there was no way we could legally put in a drain field at that point, even though this was a temporary situation. It was just a matter of like all that water had backed into the limestone and raised the water table for this period of time. Two weeks after the hurricane, it was still uh, at that state, right? So also we had rain events during that period. It wasn't draining because we were hitting groundwater and we were having a backup of rainfall as well. So that caused a lot of problems uh, in, able, in, in being able to install that drain field and septic system. Uh, and we ended up having to, to to raise it up above the the um, <laughs> the actual ground level here and build uh, uh, berms to kind of disguise it and things. So that's a real world example of what happens here. The water just gets pushed through the limestone and gets pushed up. So yeah, putting a wall around um, these municipalities, I'm I'm. I mean, they, they must have considered this in the modeling. This is the US Army Corps of Engineers, but the practicality of it, I, I just don't think is, is going to work. Yeah, we have, uh, we have requested the software files to run it on our side, but we are not sharing. And that's why uh, Theodorus and I wanna do it on our own with open access tools. As we did it, Darren, when we, compiled the, the other data. We didn't get access, so we had to do it on our own. Trust and trustworthiness, right? Yeah, I mean, what's, what's interesting is that uh, the, um, uh, the Southeast Water Management District, which we're, we're, we're under, which um, you, I, I know most of, of the um, doctorate students are, are, are uh, all over the country, and I don't know whether anyone has experienced, everyone has experienced Miami, but Miami is a series of canals, which is which which drains um, a lot of the water from the Everglades uh, out to the ocean. So so Miami was a big uh, slough that was what that was draining out water from the Everglades, and of course we built up along this east coast edge and blocked all of that drainage. So there's a series of canals. Um, that, that take the water, uh, the, the rainfall and some of the water from the Everglades and drain that into the ocean. In fact, Coral Gables was, was intended to be, uh, you know, Miami's version of Venice, you know. And if you look at uh, Fort Lauderdale, even, it's, it's a series of canals and, and water connections. Um, yeah, so, they, so that, the, the, the Water Management District has done a lot of... Um, a lot of studies on this, and I'm, and I'm sure they had some input into the into the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, study. Um, but we already know that the, that the water management district is doing things like um, we have a road that runs east to west. Um, we have several, uh, but one one road in particular runs through the lower portion of um, the Everglades, and the, there's uh, a, a big project underway. It's been underway for at least 10 years now, but they're raising the road 
to allow the water to flow back under because that was a barrier and was restricted. So there is the restoration of the, the flow of water for the Everglades. Um, and definitely that needs to be, in, be considered when we're looking at, you know, water coming from the west side through the Everglades and water piling up through storm surge from the east side. I, 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 yeah, I, it's just a, a, a very fascinating approach uh, of great infrastructure to control. This is like the attack, attack method. Um, but I think a, a more natural um, uh, approach of, of living shorelines and restoring some of these natural barriers like the mangroves uh, would be I think probably a longer lasting solution, right, Thomas? <laughs> than, than, uh, yeah. the... However, Darren, you know that uh, uh, the succession that happens with the mangroves when water level rises is not that as quick as water level rises. So, yeah, so mangroves can adapt to sea yeah. level rise. We know that that's a fact, but they yeah. can only adapt at a certain rate. And at the moment, we, we are not sure whether the level of sea level rise, uh, the rate of sea level rise uh, is greater than the ability for mangroves to adapt to that, that, that rate of rise. Yeah, and then we have the other, the other impacts like uh, the ocean currents are about to change. And when the ocean currents change by melting glaciers, that means the, the pressurization of the ocean currents will also change the height and, and, and then we have, uh, you know, we are working here because I'm doing kayaking and getting skin rash and E. coli all the time when I'm out with the kayak. As you know, I'm working with uh, the Institute of Indian Environments and they have these sensors in the water. They have a submarine in this cane. And every time I see a spill or something else, I report that to them. And interesting is that uh, all they say is they are just helpless. There's so many spills, sewage spills, leaking sewage pipes. We are based on a hundred, over a hundred year old infrastructure. It's collapsing, it's corroding. Remember the pictures that I showed? These are pictures from kayaking, just filming and, and taking images. And I even don't, we even don't use infrared cameras or other uh, diagnosis tools to get to the ground. And if you, if you, let's say, if you just invest $3 million into forensic engineers to do an assessment throughout Miami in uh, the low lying areas, you will get a report that will underline or support what uh, ReSwiss and Reminic, the big insurance companies already said for over 15 years that we are not giving any insurance policies. So what's the impact? The impact is this, are we selling our apartment? Are you selling your house? How do, we, how do we think 10, 15 years into the future with our mortgages? If you have a mortgage, it's 30 years. You can have a 15 one, 50 year one. If, we, if the municipality is, is issuing bonds that we all have because we're interested in ETFs and bonds and stocks, what are they? 10 to 15 years, that's the limit. This is how we go, incremental. Every 10, 15 years, to come up with new solutions, but it's not enough. Yeah, I'd like to go back to, to what the, the, the point you made prior to that, Thomas, and that, that um, really sea level rise is not uniform across the globe. Uh, South Florida is experiencing a higher rate of sea level rise. Uh, but, but what you mentioned was ocean currents and, and one of the, the big ocean currents that drives uh, weather phenomena uh, at least in the Atlantic, is the Gulf Stream, which which you know comes through the the Gulf the, the Gulf Bay, uh, wraps around the southern tip of Florida, heads up the whole east coast of um, the U.S. and heads off to Europe, uh, hitting hitting the United Kingdom, and uh, which uh, believe it or not keeps the the United Kingdom at a mild uh, temperature, mild climate, even though. For, for us that, that do come from the UK, I would consider it a cold climate, but it is actually <laughs> a, uh, a mild climate. Uh, and um, uh, freshwater uh, kind of leaching into the Atlantic Ocean from the north, from the North Pole, as, as, as temperatures rise and the, the poles are melting, could in fact stop that, um, 
that flow of that conveyor belt of warm water. And that would change ocean currents and change the way sea level rise is affecting different parts of the, of the Atlantic for sure. Uh, in fact, that current did, um, did stop at one point uh, during the Victorian uh, period. Uh, and uh, the UK did suffer two years of extremely cold, uh, cold weather throughout the summers and had the, the, the River Thames freeze over uh, during that period. So yeah, uh, Europe is kept warm by, by this, the, the Gulf Stream. Yeah, the, there's a question in the chat from Theodorus about the pumps in, in New Orleans. This is uh, pretty much part of the research as well when we are crunching the, the energy numbers for these uh, cities. For example, New Orleans pumping system, which is operated by the uh, sewage and water board, pumps water out of the city a rate of more than 45,000 uh, 45, uh, cubic feet or 1,300 cubic meter per second. Now add that up to 24 hours and then 365 days. But this pumping energy is based on fossil energy. And because it's based on fossil energy, that means we are triggering more climate change and, and heat increase and thermal expansion of the ocean and melting uh, glaciers. And if you look at South Florida, I showed one slide from our colleague, FIU colleague, Ogi. I can't spell out, he has a very long last name. We say Ogi. And uh, that slide shows the type of pumping systems all over Florida and dams and the age of those over hundred years, partly old, you know, and some of them are replaced maybe 10, five years old. This is the biggest problem because the more we pump, the more fossil fuel are we using. That's why we are looking at carbon positive solutions, using only strategies for retreat, relocation, elevation, et cetera, with renewable energy. We even don't look at fossil energy. I told my research team, and I'm doing the same in freelancing, Neil. Okay, so there's a client and says he doesn't want to use carbon neutral workflows or renewable energy to operate the building type. I'm out. I'm not doing it. It's a waste of my lifetime. You're not doing it. Same for research. We are not looking at these systems. I just, just wanted a, to talk about that. Yeah, a bit of background on Obi, who, who Thomas is mentioning. Uh, used to actually uh, work for the South yeah. Florida Water Management District before coming uh, to FIU as a, as a uh, as faculty and, and a researcher. Um, but going back to Theodorus's uh, point about New New Orleans, um, yes, it has. They've manipulated the water there for for decades. But New Orleans has a very different type of bedrock to. Um, to, to Miami, I mean, we're mainly a coral reef that was was underwater at one point. Uh, so the, the 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 bedrock here is an old uh, coral reef that has turned into to limestone. Yeah, we have seen in, in Miami Beach fountains of water pressuring through the system, and not just I think in Euclid Avenue where we lived before in South Beach. Uh, one of the garages doing um, King Tide, and then the, it was a sunny day. <laughs> they had an octopus coming into the garage, an octopus through the sewage system. And then uh, I think, Darren, you have like uh, Philip Stoddard and Gray Reed, you also have a pond, a little lake in your, on your property, right? You don't have. Oh, no, that, that's, that's, that's a pool. That's a swimming pool. <laughs> oh, that's, that's Philip and Gray, yeah. It's so porous. So um, let's, we'll, we'll shut down the live stream now. Um, uh, I just wanted to thank our, our speakers. Uh, also, I want to mention um, uh, that uh, Maria Flores um, will be presenting her um, sea level rise project tomorrow on Digital, digital Futures. Um, that's the, the, the young session of, of students. So uh, she'll be present, presenting that. Um, uh, so uh, we have more questions, but we'll shut down uh, the live stream. Um, 
So thank you. Um, uh, uh,